Hello, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning from Austin, Texas. My name is Cynthia Padilla, and I'm a member of the customer care team here at NIME in the Austin office. Um, I'm very happy to be here hosting this webinar, What's New in the NIME Analytics Platform 5.2. So why NIME 5.2? So let me, let me take a step back. And I know many of you have been with NIME for many years, are part of the community, and are here today to learn about 5.2, but there may be new people that are new to NIME, they don't know what NIME does. So what do we do at NIME? At NIME, we enable automation via low-code software to help our users uh, create analytics insights on their data and make sure they can create results faster on their analytics data analytics projects. Um, NIME Analytics Platform is open source. You can download it from our website and start working with your data today. Uh, you can also productionize these workflows you created in the analytics platform with the NIME Business Hub, uh, but today we're going to focus on the NIME Analytics Platform. Uh, one of our goals at NIME is to enable everybody to have access to data and data analytics. And with 5.2, we are enable a broader range of users to access analytics. How are we doing these? Uh, we made substantial improvements to the user interface and to the user experience to make sure that you know, we have a happier community. We also thank you for the feedback uh, that you provided so we can make NIME better. Um, and the goal is for all our you know, new users to enable faster and to start working on their analytics projects and upskill in analytics. And for experienced users to maybe research or go into different disciplines that they haven't tried before. And you will see that today with the new UI and the scripting capabilities. So, this will be you know, a very nice uh, webinar, I think. Uh, we also have other enhancements that are not going to be part of the webinar, but please, I recommend you to go visit our uh, website and look at what's new in 5.2. We have uh, uh, other improvements like email extensions, also improvements to the connectors of Tera Teradata and SAP HANA, and as well as updates on the Google and Microsoft authentication nodes between others. But after the webinar, please check that page. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is the agenda for today. I will introduce the speakers to you. They will go through the substantial improvements in the UI. We'll also talk about uh, KI, which is our AI assistance and the AI extension. Next, we'll go into the modernizing scripting with AI. And finally, we'll go over the reporting and visualization capabilities. So let me introduce you to the speakers. We have, they're all from the engineering team that actually work on the features. So I'm very happy that they join us today. We have Daniel Bogenreeder. He will be talking to us about um, UI updates. And what else, um, Daniel, what will you be talking today besides the updates? I will be mainly focusing on the new UI and all of the improvements we did. We received tons of feedback, as you already mentioned, and we implemented so many cool new features that I'm proud to show in a second. Excellent. Uh, we're also going to have Fabian Kubler. And Fabian, Hi, what will uh, we be covering today? Hi, good evening. So I will be talking about Kai, our AI assistant, and about the AI extensions. Excellent. And we also have Karsten Havel. Karsten? Hello. Um, yeah, so I'll show the new scripting uh, features. We have a new scripting editor for Python and a new visualization node. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We will start with Daniel. And Daniel, please go ahead and show us uh, the new UI capabilities. Thank you, Cynthia. And I'm very happy to show you the new functionality. And there's so many. So let's just dive into it. OK, so what we see here is the new modern UI. I hope that nowadays everyone has seen that already. Um, but for the new users, let's give me a very brief introduction to the tool. So on the left side, we have our utility uh, panel, where you have like the node repository, you have like the node descriptions or component descriptions, and you also have your workspace, where you can see your workflows and you can organize them. Um, then at the bottom, we have the node output. So whatever you have a node and you want to look at the table, for example, that you generate or um, the images, then you can have that inside this node output. And of course, the central piece is still the workbench where you build actually your workflow. If you, for example, don't like the node repository on the left and you want to have more space for the central piece, then you can just move them all out of your way and you can focus on this big workflow area where you can now start building your workflow. 
And there's one cool feature which makes this boat a lot more useful, and I will show that in a second. But before I do that, let's talk a bit about the Node repository. So we did some visual improvements to the Node repository here. So for example, if you hover over the Node, then you can see this is an Excel reader. It comes from Nime Excel support. And we also see that if it comes from a community extension, for example, you would see a little icon that shows you this is not a Nime native node, but this is coming from a community contribution. But we heard that this view here, like the gallery mode, is like um, a bit complex and people would like to have a list view. And this is what we added. So we have now this list view, which makes it a bit more compact. And you can see the nodes in one column and you don't have to focus um, or split your attention into these three columns that we have. Another addition that we have is this filter icon here. So we have these starter nodes, which is like a subset of nodes that we think is useful for starters because we have many, many nodes. And if you see all of them, you might get a little bit confused. So if you're a starter user or a beginner user, it might make sense to use this set here. But if you don't like that, just come back to the setting, change it to all nodes, and then you will see all the nodes. OK, for today, I will show the other features while building an actual workflow. And therefore, I will show you like one way how I build workflows. Of course, normally, you start with some source data. And of course, I could go to my file explorer and drag and drop the data in here, and it will appear with the correct reader in a pre-configured node. But I want to show you a different approach here. And this is something very cool that we added called quick node insertion. So if you're in this canvas here and you click control dot or command dot if you're on a Mac, there's this little quick node or this little search bar here where you also see the node repository. And there you can see that you only get like the compatible ports and the most useful nodes. So in this case, I'm don't have any node yet, so I don't have any connection type, but I can just see all of the source nodes. In my case, I want to have a CSV reader because I need some data. So let's open it up. We can see we will just select the file that I want to try, and it's pre-configured. Let's give it a go. You execute a node, and you can directly see all of the data down here in the output port. So normally what I tend to use if I'm getting data from customers or data from somewhere else, I have no idea how this data looks like. And I can scroll through this table here, of course, but I can also go into the statistics tab to get like a little insight on this data. For example, I see, okay, there are 24 different years. There are like five countries. And then I get a little bit of an overview about my data that I have at hand. In this case, I know the data. It's like an Olympics data set where I see how many medals each of these countries are, have won in all of these years. And one really nice addition we have here is that we can now pop out these tables. So for example, if I have a multi-monitor setup and I want to have this table on a different monitor, I can just hit this little icon. It will pop out the view and I can place this wherever I want so that I can have multiple views at once and compare different tables or a table and a visualization or whatever you want to do. Same, of course, goes for the statistics view. And of course, you don't have to click this little button here, but you can also right click, go into output port and then say you want to have the table, the statistics or the flow variables here, for example. Okay, for this particular use case, I want to create a line plot and actually one line for each country. So that I can see over time how these lines evolved and how many medals were won by the different countries. For this particular case, I need a pivot node. So I will drag it out or wait. I show you one other approach to do that. So you search for the pivot node that we want to use and you just double click on here. It will directly connect the node to the previous node you have selected, will input it and you're good to go. The pivot node is somehow a bit of a complex node. And I don't want to go into the details here, but I'm showing this here because Fabian is showing you in a second how easy it is to configure such nodes with the new AI functionality we added. For now, you just have to believe me that I know what I'm doing. And I want to group by year. The pivot is in this case, the country. And the manual aggregation is in this case, the medal count. And it doesn't really matter what I'm aggregating for because every row is only once in my data set. I'll change like the aggregation or like the column names to be kept as the originals. We execute it and we can see, okay, this is pretty much what I want. I now have like one column for the year and then I have several columns for the different countries. With that, I can just drag it out again, search for the line plot because I want to have a line plot and then open the configuration menu. 
With the new visualizations, we've already shown this before, but maybe for new users, you now have like a preview of actually what you get on the left and on the right side, the node configuration. So I can now here, for example, type in something and I will see it's directly updated and reflected in the view itself. Well, I guess I'm done already. This is pretty much what I want. I have a line plot and visualization and I can now have that and see how it looks like. But if you look a bit closer, there might be some things that might be not correct right now. So there, the date format, I don't really like that. I maybe only want to have the year. One problem here is that in my data set, I have like the year as a string type. And the line plot doesn't really understand what strings are, so it needs a date and time input. For that, I need to convert the string to a date time, and therefore I can just search for string to date time. And one other method to add this node is now dropping it onto the connection between those two nodes where I want to have it. You just let it go, and it will place it in between these two nodes, connect it directly, so I'm all good to go. I configure the node, just let it guess the data type. In this case, it works. I hit OK. I open it up and I can see, OK, nice. Now I have the years and I can also zoom in and see that the visualization now interpolates these years. OK, but now I'm done, right? OK, in most cases that might be the case, but I, for myself, I like to share these things that I did. I can want to create a data app out of it or a reusable component to just make it useful in the future for myself. And to be honest, I mean, a line plot node that has a title line plot is not really that useful. So of course, I could just change the title inside here, but I want to show you one other approach. So let's add a string configuration node. And this node is particularly useful if you have a component, because then you can change the title on the fly from outside of the component. And I will show that in a second. So let's first of all call this thing here title. Let's call it a flow variable title. And let's add some meaningful title for the default. For example, Olympics data from X to Y, because I currently don't know the dates. We hit OK. We just connect this up to the line plot. And let's open up the line plot. And one nice addition that we added here is that we can now configure the flow variables directly at the input fields where they belong to. So if I want to control this title attribute here, then let's just click this little flow variable icon. I select the title, and then you can see it is applied. It is disabled. I cannot change it anymore because it is overwritten by a flow variable. And I also see it directly reflected in the view. Okay, now that we have that, we're close to be able to share that component. And that's what we're now doing. So by pressing Control J or Command J, you can create a component out of that. We name it, for example, Olympics Analyzer. Maybe a bit too much, but <laughs> we add some functionality to it. Um, and then we can open the configuration panel of this component. There, this is what I meant with the configuration string input, where you can now change this to whatever you want. And then you will see that the title in the view itself is adjusted. So I can just call that something else. I open up the view of the composite view, and then you can see that it's now applied correctly. OK, now I have this very, very simple component, but it may, might make sense to share this with others. If they have a loop and iterate over some years and want to adjust the title, they could now do that. So let's just share this component. We go into Component and then Share. We select where we want to store it and select the link. And then we can see that we now have this Olympics Analyzer component, which we now have in our workflow repository. And if you want to use that at some other place, just drag and drop it into your workflow, and you can make use of that. When doing so, I realize, OK, but that's not really useful yet, because I don't have any information on how people would use that. I mean, I have no information on this here. And also, there's no node icon, just a gray background, so I don't really recognize this node easily. OK, to fix this, let's open up the component. Let's go into the meta editing. And then we can add some useful description, of course. And we can also, for example, upload a icon. In this case, I just choose the name icon. We do that. We save this component. We go back. And then we can hit component and update component. And you will see that it's directly updated. If you now would open this component from the uh, from the beginning, then you would get a little message that there are some updates available for your components, and it would automatically update your components if you click on accept. 
One other thing I missed to explain, and we heard a lot of feedback of people using it, and I myself use it all the time. So I really like to have organized workflows where the connections are in line. And if you have more connections, you can now have band points back. So for example, you can align these two, and you only see one connection going out here until they split off, and it looks much nicer in this case. That's all for what I want to show now. Um, we added a bunch of more features, but for that, just go to our change log and check the What's New page to get a list of all the features we have. And with that, back to you, Cynthia. Thank you, Daniel. Really, really nice. It looks really good. And you know, I, I haven't tried everything, but the other day I was reading our forum, somebody said that they were very impressed with the way that you can copy the fields. Um, can you elaborate a little bit uh, on that? Yes, so we did some major improvements to our table output. If you can bring it back my screen for a quick second. So you can now select cells of this table view. For example, here I want to have these values. And then just by pressing Control Z or Command Z, you will also see a little indication that it's now copied to your clipboard and you can just paste it into Excel, into Google Spreadsheet or wherever you want and just continue work on there. Great, that, that's that's really useful. So thank you very much for that, Daniel. Appreciate it. Next, uh, let's go ahead and move forward with Fabian. So Fabian will come to the stage and talk to us about the improvements on KI and the AI extension. Hi again, Cynthia. So I want to talk about Kai and about the AI extension. So, but let's start with Kai. So Kai is an um, AI assistant and it has two different modes. So it has this question and answer mode in which it answers all your questions about NIME and how to use NIME. So this is a great way to get to know NIME and for upskilling as well. And then also it has this build mode. And in this build mode, it really can help, help you in building workflows. So um, we introduced Kai already with version 5.1. And with version 5.2, we wanted to make Kai easier to find and easier to install. And this is why we have added this AI assistant sidebar here. And we show it even if you haven't installed it yet. So you can just click the button and the installation menu opens. And if you, if you don't want to use, use Kai, and if you don't want to see this extension, uh, the sidebar, you can just disable it via a system prop. But let's say you want to use Kai. Um, so then you go to the sidebar, and so you have installed it already, of course. And um, generally speaking, with version 5.2, um, we made the answers of Kai just a whole lot better. So the quality of the answers is way better. Um, the answers are way more specific and way more useful. So, but maybe let's just give this a try. So I'm copying in here a question, and that is, how can I do random forest prediction? And I'm sending that question, and let's wait a bit. But something that you will see now is that this answer really streams in token by token now, and the, the time um, for waiting for the answer is less annoying. And also, the formatting is way nicer. And the feature that me personally, I really like a lot, is this question mark up here. So and we, if you scroll up a bit, you will see like now Kai gives you the sources that were used to compile the answer. So if I click here, this opens up in the browser. So this does open up now on my second screen. Um, so I cannot show it to you, unfortunately. Um, but but um, what Kai gives me also is note suggestions. So these notes, they might be um, helpful for my task at hand, and I can just drag and drop them over. And something that we have changed in version 5.2 as well is that Kai now is really aware of the conversation history. So if I add another question here, can I do it with Spark? So this question really relates to my first question. And this is something that Kai is now able to understand. And this makes the conversation feel just so much, much more natural. So let's wait a bit. And here again, I get a node suggestion, but here now for a node or for extension that I haven't installed yet. So if I click it, this again opens in the browser and I can just easily install that 
get rack and drop. So this is something that I don't want to do yet, but right now, but instead I want to show you the build mode. So um, with version 5.2, we just made the build mo mode way more reliable. So the build mode now doesn't support as many nodes as it did before. Um, so, but this is something that will change in the future. So, but it is something that you have to keep in mind. So it doesn't support as many nodes, but it is way more reliable now. So, and how does this work? So I have to select a node. So, and this node is executed already and it has some data. And now I can um, give Kai like a query. So this reads, give me the average years of education for all different education forms. And I just hit enter um, to send this query and we wait a bit. This is exciting. Okay, it worked, perfect. Um, and as we see, so it added this group by now, this makes sense. I'm just going to execute it. And this makes sense as well. So um, pretty cool. I'm going to delete this node again, and I'm going to ask a second question. So, and this, this query reads, please create a scatter plot age versus hours work per week. Do this only for people older 40. And here again, I have to select the node. Um, I send the query and we wait a bit. And again, it's exciting for me. Ah, okay, perfect. Row filter, that makes sense. So only people older 40. Now it's about plotting. Ah, okay, perfect. It added this, um, this node for plotting. And this is actually something that I don't want to go into detail now because Carsten is going to show that later. So I leave you here with a bit of a cliffhanger. And instead, I want to talk um, about the AI extension. So the AI extension as well, we have introduced that already with version 5.1. So, but what is the AI ex extension? So this is a set of nodes that helps you to integrate generative AI or large language models into your own, into your own workflows. And we got a lot of feedback from users and there were two things um, that we heard often. And um, that concerns on the one hand, data governance, on the, on the other hand, data privacy. So a lot of users didn't want to use the open AI nodes or the open AI services directly, but instead they wanted to use their services from Microsoft Azure. And that is why we implemented these Azure open AI nodes, which allow you to, to use Microsoft Azure instead. And something that we heard very often as well is that users want to be able to use their like to use open source model models on their own hardware and so that the data doesn't leave their machine and for this we invested a lot of work into these gpt for all nodes um but like let's have a look into a workflow so in this little workflow what i want to do is i want to do a sentiment analysis so i have these customer reviews here in my table and i'm creating a second column here so and this Second column is my prompt, right? So it reads, please read the sentiment, please rate the sentiment from one very negative to 10 very positive and return only the number. And then um, it has this um, customer review as a string. And um, all, all, all this data I'm just um, sending in into my LLM prompter, which give, which give this then to an LLM. And we can have, have a look at the result. Um, so I have run this before, and as we see, here we get the sentiment. So this is a, just a very, very easy way um, to, to calculate the sentiment um, over a certain text. So, and as we see here, so I'm, here I'm already using these Microsoft Azure OpenAI nodes. So I'm, I'm not using the, the OpenAI services, but instead I'm using the Microsoft services. And the sub second topic that I said we heard a lot about um, is data privacy. So here again, let's have a look at the workflow, right? So this is a little AI assistant application. So if I click here, we see I have this, um, this AI assistant chat. And what's super interesting here is 
we're not only talking to the LLM, but we are injecting our own data here. So here in this case, this is um, just some data that I fetched from Wikipedia, but this also could just be your company data. And then like he, here in this case, I'm really able to ask questions about the data and I get answers um, about the data. So, and what's here now really magic for me is we're using these JPT, GPT for all nodes. And what that means is we're using an open source model that is running on my own machine here. So um, this data never, never leaves my machine and like doesn't leave for the internet. So this is super nice. And what I wanna show last but not least is um, our new DALI mode. So DALI is a model that is provided by OpenAI in the cloud and it is able to generate image um, when I provide a text prompt. So, and as Christmas is coming near, I thought it would be nice to um, send customized, customized Christmas greetings to my colleagues. And for this, what I have here is I have a list of imaginary colleagues and their favorite animal. And here again, I'm creating um, another column that I'm calling prompt. And here this reads, please create a Christmas greeting, ca greeting card with this animal. And then it's dolphin, eagle, and so on. I am looping um, over all over all these rows, and then I'm putting this data in into this um, DALI node, and this then really is able to create an image for me, and I'm collecting this um, this data then with this joiner. And unfortunately, I have forgot to um, click execute here, um, so this takes a while. But um, of course, I have um, prepared something so we can have have a look here. So an SUC. Here we have then all these um, customized greeting cards. And with this, I give back to you, Cynthia. Excellent. Well, thank you, Fabian. I really appreciate that. You know, one of my favorite features on KI is sometimes I forget the name of the notes. So I ask her a few questions or, and, and, you know, I. It gives me a list of notes or the instructions so I can go and follow. It's like our workflow coach, um, really, but exactly. more yep. intelligent. So thank you very much. You're Next, uh, we're going to have Carson. He's going to come on stage and he's going to go over the scripting improvements. Go ahead, Carson. Exactly. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, so you've already seen the modern UNI now and uh, the AI capabilities that Fabian showed. And um, so it's pretty much all about modern UI and AI. And the combination of both is basically the new editor. Um, in we have for the Python script node, we have built a completely new editor. Uh, let me briefly show you the data before I do something with it. This is what Daniel also showed. It's the, the Olympics data where for each here we basically have different sports and we know who won which medal and which sex they have and where they're coming from and so on. Um, yeah, so I'll play around with this in the new Python script editor now. Um, what you see in the middle is the, the editor. Um, this is based on Monaco, the same backend that is used in Visual Studio Code, if you know that. Um, and if you have used the old Python script editor, you will find and all the features that were there before. You have the inputs on the left-hand side, your input table, flow variable access, um, output table, and um, on the right-hand side, a preview for the, the variables. If, you're, if you have run the script, um, you have a console down here for output, and now let's just get going. So I have a bunch of unfinished things in the code here, so I want to get the input table. And what you can do with this new editor is now you can select which columns. So I'm holding down command on Mac or it would be control on, on Windows and Linux. So you can hold down and you can select a bunch of columns if you want to work with these and drag and drop them into the, um, into the editor. And then you could you get a pandas data frame created with these columns. But I actually want the whole table because I want to append something there. So I'll pick the whole table and store that in my data frame. Um, you maybe saw that the edition always had 
the word Olympics in there so I can easily work with this. But uh, one thing I want to show you about this, what is very cool, is that the names of the columns are also available via auto completion. So if I know ah, this is addition, uh, or starting with E, I have actually both event or edition available, um, and just get the auto completion for the column name like that. Um, and then I know ah, at the end of the script, um, I will have to write something to the output table. So again, I can grab the output table here, make this no to do anymore. And um, <clears throat> now you can very, get very nice auto completion of all the um, imported modules. So this is our NIMIO package. Uh, there are some tables in there. I know that I have to build a table. And if you click this side, bar uh, this this arrow icon to the side you'll get all kinds of completion so it tells you ah, i can create a table from pandas that's what i'm going to do so i use from pandas and then you also get all the information about what these parameters mean the easy way here i don't need anything special i can just use the data frame run this and then you'll see okay i didn't do populate any other variable than data frame, and I have imported a module. So if you click on this data frame up here, you can get the contents printed uh, in the console for easy debugging. You can also just select a few lines and execute those to do something. Uh, but now it didn't change anything because I had done this before. OK, mm, so this is the scripting editor. Um, I mentioned that we have AI integration, and you've seen the cool things that AI, that Kai can do in terms of building a workflow or explaining you which nodes to use, what how to go about certain problems, how you would solve them in Nime. And now let's do the same thing here. We can ask Kai from the script editor. Again, uh, this is the, you need to install the AI assistant the same way as Fabian was showing. But once you have installed this. Um, well, it tells you that um, we do communicate uh, some information about your table, namely the, the names of the columns, the data types, and also the code that you have in there um, to OpenAI, to the provider of ChatGPT. Um, and uh, because otherwise we could not write code that actually uses these, inf these things. Um, but it will never share the contents of the table. So it will never see any data that's actually in there. It only knows about the column names and this code. Um, yeah, and so now I have this prompt here. I'll dispatch it. It'll take a little while. If you've played around with the different GP chat GPT versions, this uses chat GPT-4, which is a little bit slower, but it usually gives better results. And now, I asked it to group the data by country and sport, and then count the number of medals, which was actually the to do in the code. And it did exactly that. So here you see a diff view. You can look at the green lines, what will be the ones that, the, that will be added to your editor if you click this button. Um, and it actually grouped by country and sport, and then counted the medals, stores this in a new data frame, and updated how uh, which data frame I'm using as output table, which is very smart. So insert this in the editor, run, works. This is nice. You can print the group data frame. And it shows down here that it has grouped everything by metal. Cool. And obviously now if you run the node, you'll get uh, these grouping outputs Oops, uh, down here. <clears throat> so far, so good. This is the new scripting editor. Um, if you have used this before in, for instance, a component that you wanted to share with someone the same way Daniel was showing before, um, you might know that sharing a Conda environment, if you have some special Python packages that you need, is not always easy. So um, we have this node, Conda environment propagation, which knows which Python environments I have on my machine. Here I have picked one of the many that I have because I'm working a lot with Python. Um, and then inside the script node, I can now use this uh, cube up menu on the top right to set the Python environment. And there, by default, it uses the one that's specific, uh, configured in the nine preferences. But I can tell it to use the Conda environment flow variable that is coming in. 
And when I go back now, you also see it in the console that it uses the one that I selected. You might have noticed that I picked GeoPandas. Um, and if I go back to what was selected before, it'll also tell me that it changed the Python executable. And now it's using my NIME installation. That is the NIME version I'm running right now, which is nice. Um, so this is how you can configure which Python version it uses. And just word, one more word about this menu. There's also some uh, information on uh, how to use the Python integration in NIME and what the API of this NIME IO module actually is. So far, so good. The other node, the other important node of the Python integration is a Python view, which allows you to create a view. Um, and I'll ask it to do that using AI. And I have prepared a prompt here. <clears throat> well, it looks pretty much the same as the other node, but um, it has an output preview on the side. So here we will see the image once we run it. Um, now let me paste the prompt and then let's see what I've asked. So I want a sunburst chart. We're using Plotly, which is a Python plot -like plotting library, um, showing the number of medals won grouped by first country, uh, first by country, and then by sports, because I want um, a two-layer sunburst chart. And it started from nothing. It created the whole thing, imported our NIME IO package, Plotly, generated the plot, and put that into the dedicated output view variable, which looks very good. Uh, so let's try on the code. And here we go. We have a really cool chart that shows us which country has won how many medals and which sports, actually. So the multi-layer sunburst chart, which is very nice. Um, OK, so much for the new Python nodes. Um, just briefly, there are some more updates on the Python side. If you've ever developed your own Python um, nodes in Python for NIME, because that also works. If you haven't seen that before, you might ignore that. But um, in these nodes, you can now access NIME credentials. So use these passwords to log into any uh, services from Python. Mm, then also these Python nodes now respect the pro proxy settings configured in NIME. Um, <clears throat> we've also mitigated some install problems on Windows uh, that these extensions could have, because Windows uh, doesn't support super long paths, sometimes in some certain circumstances. And lastly, the bundled Python environment. So the one that we ship when you install these nodes here, the Python script and the Python view node, um, this now comes with Python 3.11 and Pandas 2.0. Um, before we were using Python 3.9, so an older version. So you get the latest now. OK, enough Python. Uh, let me quickly talk about the other visualization node that um, that you already oops, sorry that you already saw uh, because Fabian showed that Kai is able to configure this. Um, maybe Fabian, we can give back to you later and you can show that this node actually produced a plot. Um, what I'm going to show you is I have the same some some sports data now it's a little bit i've actually run the pivot note that daniel was also showing so for each sport i have a, a female number of medals won by female athletes and the number of medals won by male athletes and now i can create a plot from that and now this view again looks similar to the scripting editor it has the inputs on the left hand side has an editor a console on the right hand side, though, because we start empty, it has a template gallery. So we have a bunch of options that we can choose from. And these are actually already showing you the output with this, with the data that you have connected to the node, which is really cool because you can already get a glimpse of what this will look like. So I like this one down here, stacked area chart. And once you click it, it'll insert the code on the left hand side. It will show this interactive plot on the right hand side. And <clears throat> you'll see that you can edit this and compare to the Python node where you always have to execute here, it's instantaneous, whatever you change. The same way as Daniel was showing with the line chart, because this eCharts node, eCharts is the Apache library that we use in the line plot and in this node here. So they basically behave the same, have the same look and feel. Um, so I could say, 
medals, oops, medals, one per gender. Uh, and then you see the plot updating in real time. I can, I don't know, probably change something else, but um, should be fine. You, you, you saw that it changes. The other thing is <clears throat> um, there are some more templates that might not fit the data because you saw I only had one string and two numeric columns. There are some more plots like Sankey charts, heat maps in this gallery. And if you look at the explanation, if you click this question mark, it will show you how the data should look like that you need to actually use this plot. But right now I could insert it, but it won't work. And there's an explain, explore more button because this eCharts library has a huge selection of templates. I'll bring the tab in from my second screen <clears throat> and just quickly show you um, that, yeah, this is a huge library. You could pick one of these, take it, copy the code that they have. This looks very similar to what we have in Lime, right? So here you can just copy the code, paste it in and look at the view and then you get exactly the same. And here, just to give you the idea of how you would actually go about this, if you want to customize this to the data that you have here, you have a series with some data, but I know I don't want this pre-configured data. I want my data from my input table. I can drag that in, you can drag in the mail medals and you can drag in the appropriate access labels because I know these are the sports. And ta -da, you already have configured the example from the eChats website to your data, which is really cool. Now, lastly, um, <clears throat> this thing also has an AI integration. And let me quickly copy a prompt to make this quick. <clears throat> so if you want, if you have a special specific idea of how the plot should look like that come that should come out of here, for instance, before in this stacked area chart, the and you can also maybe see it very briefly here, you can't see all the labels of the different sports. And so I told it here that I want the x-axis labeled rotated by 90 degrees so that we can show all of them. And now once I do this, you see it actually did that um, in a bar chart. Okay, that's it for this new visualization note. Back to Cynthia. Thank you, Carson. Uh, I really, really like all the improvements. Um, just a quick question. Um, with the AI integration, does any of my data go outside my, net my network? Um, as I briefly said before, the, we do send not the data, but information about your tables. So the column names, because in the prompt, you would probably refer to the data somehow via the column names. Um, and so the column names are going, the data types of these columns, uh, if it's strings or numbers, and in for the code we actually also ship the code that you currently had in the editor because then we can improve upon it so if for instance there was an error and then uh you you ask the kai to fix the error paste the error in then it will take the code fix the error and update the code excellent well, thank no you data, very much not, not no content of your table is ever going away excellent thank you very much well let's go ahead go back to daniel Daniel will cover the UI improvements, uh, the visualization and reporting improvements. Ahead, yes, Dan. exactly. Thank you, Cynthia. So, okay, let's take one step back before we jump right into it. So why did we do reporting? So reporting, I mean, we've all seen this nice stuff that Karsten and also um, Fabian just presented. And what was missing always was a bit this functionality to put these things from your data apps into a report that you can save, that you can share via email or just wherever you want to put this then elsewhere. So we thought, okay, we have this capability of nice data apps already. You can lay out them, you can make them really nice looking. Um, so why not having a possibility from these data apps to convert them into something that you can easily share, um, for example, like a PDF. And this is exactly what we did. So we improved our components and you, if you open up the layout editor, which you can now do from the outside, then you can see that you have this little checkbox here, which is called enable reporting. And you can just hit this box. And after that, you will see that you have two ports added to it, the input port and the output port. The input port needs a report template node, so a report template creator. 
and you can just connect this to the newly added input. This repo template creator is very simple at the moment, and you can just configure like the page size you want to have later in your PDF, and also the page orientation that you would like it to have, for example, portrait or landscape. And with that, we can execute the component, and you can already see all set, you're done. You have this report here, you can see the boundaries about uh, around your report, and you can now, for example, decide if you want to write this report um, as a PDF to your disk, or you can also write this as an HTML to your disk and then do whatever you want with it. This is very cool, but we added some more things to make this reporting even more useful. Especially when you have reports, corporate reports, then you usually also have a color scheme. For example, I don't know, your uh, data needs to match a certain color that your company has. And we enhanced our color manager to be able to do exactly that. So previously, remember this was the example with the lines for each country. And if we now open up the color manager, then we want to assign a color to each of these columns. So we can now select column names here, and then we can choose a color for each of these columns. For example, I don't know why, but I want um, USA to be always like this green here. I can just set this up, press OK, and you can directly see this applied to the table, to the output table. So you can see the colors are there for the different columns. As soon as you put this into the line plot, then this line plot also automatically uses this color and makes the lines appear in this color. Of course, we not only added this functionality to the line plot, but we enabled it for basically all of the new views we have in Lime, so that you can now make use of these things in your report and have very nice corporate colored reports. Another addition that we did for this was to add a text view. Normally in your report, you want to have some section which explains what this graph is about, or you want to have some slide in or page in the beginning with some text explaining what this report is all about. And for that, the text view is super useful. So if you open it up, you have a blank screen because you have not inputted anything in here, but you have this nice rich text editor, which accepts markdown. What that means is that, for example, you can put in some markdown code, for example, it's free hashtags, it's like a headline free, and you can then write some report content. Um, of course, you have all of the other formatting options that this thing gives you here, but I guess you can explore them yourself. But remember, we had this one string configuration flow variable where we set the title. So we can, for example, just connect this one to our text view. And the really cool thing about this text view is that you can make use of this directly in the text view. So we have some placeholder syntax, which is also explained in the note documentation. And you can just write in put here title. And then you see that it's directly translated into the value of the actual flow variable. So that if you have, for example, a loop where you want to say, OK, one report per year, for example, but you, of course, want to know which year this report is for, then you can easily make that possible with this flow variable here inside the text view. The text view then behaves as any other node. So you can just open up the layout editor. You position it wherever you like it. And then you just create your report. And you will see that this now is in there. Of course, let me just quickly prove to you that it is also working with the PDF writer. Um, and I will just put it into my direction. I'm pretty sure I have the same file already in here, so I will override it. And then if you open up this PDF, then you can see that you have now a nicely generated PDF with nine. As easy as that. OK, but what if you have more components? You want to concatenate the reports together, or you just want to have different pages? Then, of course, you can just use a report concatenate node. Or if you want to have like a linear report, you can just continue with this one into the next component. You don't need a report template creator every time, but you can just use this output port here and append to the previous report. For now, let's just make use of the report concatenator, which allows me to combine two reports. We just take the same report for this demo purpose here, and I want to insert a page break between each of these pages. And if I do that, I execute it, then I can already see in the preview here that we now have two separate pages. And imagine if you're in a loop, for example, as I explained, you could have like year one and year two here as a title, and you could have the different reports for these years. Of course, you write that out to PDF, and then you have a PDF with the two pages. Um, let me 
quickly open this up that you believe me and you will see these two pages in here. And that's, I mean, not all for the reporting, but all I want to show here and just try it out yourself and give us feedback. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. That's very, very, very nice. Um, I do have a question. Uh, some of my customers are using BERT today for reporting. Would BERT go away? And what, you know, what would they move to the new reporting? No. So BERT will not move away. BERT is still available if you switch to the classic UI. We won't port this to the new UI, but um, for the old UI, I mean, remember, you can always switch back to the classic UI. If you miss anything, in the modern UIs, just switch back and you can make use of it. And that's the same for BERT. Um, but in general, I mean, BERT, if you've ever used it, it can be very complex. So for a new user, I would definitely recommend you to try out our reporting. And if that's sufficient, then just use that. And if that's not sufficient, maybe just write into the forum what you're missing. And then we can try to give you a solution for that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. So we'll bring back uh, Fabian and Carson for the Q&A session. So thank you everybody for entering questions today. Let me go and see what we have. Okay, we're having here. And um, so this one is not a question, it's a comment for you and the engineering team. Uh, not a question, but the AI assistant is incredibly useful. Thanks for implementing it. <laughs> thank you, that's from Mike Lin. Uh, this question is for Carson. Um, Okay, let me read, read it. Uh, the new Python node is my new favorite node with the AI integration. <laughs> it is now much easier to simplify the flow. I would like to know if these nodes will have more improvements or if that is the final phase. I say this because it, was, it has a lot of potential. For example, adding self-checking before submitting the code. So instead of seeing the error and then trying to fix it, it tests it, it gives you advice uh, to the user if the code is very difficult to try to split it. So that may be a very good update. So Carson, do you plan any more improvements on the Python scripting? That is a very nice idea. So right now, <clears throat> I think we what we, uh, we're planning in the direct future is to extend this to even more programming languages because Naim has more scripting integrations. So we'll use this editor, including AI assistance for more languages. But while we're working on that, doing something like that would be nice. Yes. Checking, I, I'll just say one, one more thing to that because I like the idea checking the syntax makes sense, which we, where we could see that the <laughs> script is correct, but executing it, I would rather not do that automatically, but wait for the user to click on that because I mean, just in case you ask the AI to delete a specific file, but the script then deletes all of the files in your hard drive and you let this run without checking it. Well, so. <laughs> that would be good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's a good a, idea. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the idea. Uh, this is for Fabian from Ricardo Montero. Is the AI assistant both QA and build working locally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. So right now this is not running locally, but there's a backend service in either the community hub or your own business hub. And this service then um, communicates with OpenAI or Microsoft Azure for OpenAI. So the data um, leaves your machine. So that is your question, um, of course, but, um, and then also, um, like for the build mode, a table signature. So if you have selected a note, um, a note, not the data of the table is leaving your system, but the table signature, just the same that um, Carsten told us before. So that is something that you have to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, this area is very much in flux. So for the future, um, we are thinking about also trying open source models. And yeah, we just have to see how things turn out. Excellent, thank you. Uh, there's another question for you, Fabian. When using the AI assistant to build, does it consume the data points in some way to provide the answer? What to make? I want to make sure that no data from the tables gets shared outside my environment. Yeah, 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 like, good question again. So um, the data itself is not leaving your computer. So the content of the table is not leaving your computer, um, but the signature of the table that is the column names, um, they very well might leave your computer. Excellent, thank you. 
Uh, one more question for uh, Daniel from Angel Garcia. Uh, do I have the option to choose a custom color palette for charts? That is a very good and, question. Okay. Um, I mean, in general, in the color manager, you can customize whatever you want. So if you have the columns, then you can give them a specific uh, color. But I think what you more want is to define it once and then use it over and over again um, as a palette that you always have the same colors. And I think this is currently not yet possible. This is a very good idea. We'll definitely create a ticket for that one. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question for uh, Fabian. Can I use Hugging Face instead of OpenAI? Um, yes, you can Hugging Face. Uh, you can use Hugging Face. <laughs> so um, for the people not in the know, like Hugging Face is a different service that um, allows you to use um, open source models in the cloud or locally on your machine. And we actually have nodes for that, so you can either use the cloud services of Hugging Face if you provide mm -hmm. your API key, or you can run this locally as well with our nodes. Excellent, thank you. Next, uh, another question for Karsten. Which Python versions are supported in 9AP Analytics Platform 5.2? Um, as I, as a good question, yeah, as I mentioned that we are updated from Python 3.9 to Python 3.11 for the environment that we ship with the Python integration, but from Python 3.8 to Python 3.11, these are the versions that we're actually testing internally all the time, so these are supported. We didn't update to 3.12 yet if you want to use the latest and greatest, <laughs> but that will, that support will come soon. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Daniel, Fabian, and Karsten for going over the features on the Nine Analytics Platform 5.2. Great improvements in the UI. I think more more users will be able to work, you know, build uh, workflows faster, really, and upskill on analytics. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And we will ask you to share your experience with the Nine Analytics Platform on Trust Radio. Um, if you can uh, put a comment review, that would be great so others can know what NIME, NIME is about and how you're using NIME. And um, that's it for today. Please, let's keep in touch. Visit us at NIME.com. So you want to review the features that we covered today. We'll list them there. We also have additional features that you can review. Uh, follow us Follow us in social media. We have a nice uh, NIME uh, YouTube channel, NIME TV, where you can find many other recordings and how to do things. In Nine, also download Nine from our website and start using 5.2 and give us your feedback uh, in the forum. So thank you very much, everybody, and happy Nine Me.